All right, we're going to look at Simplify 3D today. That's a different slicer than what we've been using. We'll, we'll go through how it's different from Cura and how it's the same and how you use it a little bit. Um, and we got a few updates on our uh, blaster project that we've been working on. Uh, and I guess we'll start with these. Uh, so now we have both handles, both sides. Now they look different. I don't know how much they look different on camera. They, yeah, I think you can tell the difference. Um, and the difference is, so this is the one that we did first. And the order uh, we did, well, we printed it. And then Adhesion Promoter sent, well, before we did the Adhesion Promoter uh, on both of these. So both of these have... You can see them side by side now. Both of them printed uh, some amount of sanding. This one I did more sanding on than this one. And so I think you, you can actually see that difference right in there, mainly right up there. Um, but uh, so sanding, filing, uh, and then adhesion promoter, primer, sand the primer, and paint them with a really light coat of like a thin coat of a or a burnt orange color it was what it was um, so they both had all of that then this one I did a wash over it uh, and then the polyurethane you know the wood stain stuff uh, this one I did the polyurethane and then the wash um, and then I went back on this one and uh, did a gloss coat and another wash on it because it was just totally different color uh, so you can kind of see the difference just the you can do the same processes um, but the order that you do them can change things so here and and they both look okay I like this one more though um, so I'm not sure yet if I will reprint this one and do it in the same order as this one or just leave them as different because they there are different pieces of wood so certainly they could look different that might be fine um, it probably rather them look similar though um, I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it or not to do, but it, it does give you an idea of how just the different orders that you might do things create different effects. Um, I don't think I want to go in and add the wash on top of this one that I'd used on this one. Before I added the wash on this one, they were drastically different, and it was just the, the order of operations was, was the only difference. Um, I put the wash on top of here to make it kind of look like the other one. Um, it's not as shiny. I don't know. Yeah, you can probably tell it's not as shiny. Um, but uh, it's definitely not as orange either, which I kind of like the orange color. Um, if I had done this one first, I'd have probably been fine with that. It looks good. But having done this one first, I actually like it more. Oh, there was one step that I did to both of them in between there. I kind of went in and just drew streaks. You can see them better on the lighter one. Just streaks of a lighter brown color uh, across there. I can't remember what it was called. I think it was called oiled leather, oiled or old, I don't remember, <laughs> leather. Um, and I just kind of drew streaks across there to kind of show some different uh, textures in the wood or different colors in the wood. Um, I did the same thing on this one. You just don't see them as much because everything's darker. All right. And um, we did this on camera where actually I may not have done all of this. I may have come back and done some more. We just dry brushed some silver across here to show kind of some scratches. Uh, and then uh, I applied a dull coat to it, so a, basically a flat clear on top of it all, and that really made it look way more metal in my mind. Um, it was kind of too shiny before, um, and so we're at this stage. Now we got this and this. we we'll glue them together. Now they do have little screw holes. I am not going to screw the things together. I don't intend to take it apart or anything, um, so I'm going to glue it all together. That looks, I mean, that looks good. Other than the fact that the two handles are pretty different, or the two sides are pretty different colors, um, it actually looks pretty good. Um, I might go back and reprint this one and do it this way because I do like this one more. Um, but uh, like I said, I'm not really that interested in making them identical, um, but I do like that one a lot more. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to 3D print. Maybe we'll even model these today. I don't know. It depends on how long we get into Simplify 3D. Um, but we did that. So it looks good, I think. Um, there's a lot more of the body of it up here that we need to, to work on. Um, but these, I'm just going to print some little um, conical shaped uh, screw heads and glue them in there to fill in that hole. 
Um, and we'll probably use the gold rub and buff on those uh, and then maybe a dark wash to make them not so shiny. Um, so that's what we'll probably do with that. Um, on here, remember, this was the piece I showed you what happens when you just primer it and paint black paint on top of it. You get a lot of uh, the lines still showing through the print lines, which kind of ruins the effect of it looking like it's made out of a piece of metal. So on the side that actually shows, I went in and did a lot of sanding. And um, on these pieces over here, I was able to get pretty smooth. Like you don't really see, and, I, and I'll go back and I, I will add primer. I haven't done that yet so you can see this part of it. Um, but on this face, I never could get it. This face was on the bed, um, but maybe I just didn't get it uh, close enough to the bed and you, you see too much of the uh, layer line. So what I did with that is I sanded it flat uh, as much as I could. Um, I probably could have sanded a little more, but I wanted to do this so you can see how it looks too. Um, so I used some putty. Now this is for like if you're making model airplanes and cars and all that kind of stuff. Um, you have to order it. You're, unless you have a hobby shop nearby, you're not going to find it anywhere. Um, so you have to order it otherwise. And uh, there's a decent substitute in the auto uh, repair industry. So you go to some, any, well, even Walmart probably. Um, and there's a Bondo Red Spot Glaze or Spot Putty. I think it's called Red Spot Glaze is what it's actually called. Um, and it's in a tube. So this, this is what's inside here. So this is just a tube of putty. Um, the, the red one's actually, I don't know, three or four times that size and probably the cheaper um, and they don't need any chemicals to make them harden you just spread them out and they cure on their own um, this one cures really quickly like you can hardly finish spreading it before it's already cured and the spot glaze takes probably a couple of minutes to cure or to harden now to cure all of this stuff takes hours or longer to actually cure and become solid all the way through um, but this one becomes unworkable in just a few minutes um, whereas the red spot glaze probably lasts for a couple of minutes still being workable. You, you work it with something like this, uh, something that's kind of flexible. You can use any partic anything that has a straight edge on it and that will sort of flex a little bit. Um, so this is what I had. And you spread it on the surface that you think has the holes in it, the divots, and then you block sand it. If, now, I will say that on this piece, I did a lot of sanding that was not block sanding or with a sanding stick. I, I just used a piece of sandpaper and myself, uh, you know, my hand. And um, that will work uh, as long as you know what the rules are. So you have to kind of, I'm telling you things that will work uh, to get you started, assuming you've never done anything like that, like always use a block sander, always use a sanding stick and all that. And once you know those rules, then you can start to break them and you know when, all right, it's okay if I do sand with just my fingers right here so you kind of have to know all the rules before you know which ones you can break and when you can break them um, so i did do a lot of sanding like this with sandpaper um, but this part um, this is going to be on the outside like a, right in the side a big feature that you'll see so I, I did do a lot of block sanding on this and you can kind of see actually let's see if it works better to zoom in oh yeah so what you're looking for here is it has all these holes in it you coat it with a relatively thin coat of something like this. And then when you block sand it, you're, you're not trying to um, necessarily sand all of anything away. You want it to leave basically the pattern so you can see that it has filled in all of these holes. Um, now, if I kept sanding, this stuff sands at a very different rate from the plastic. This is way softer and easier to sand than the plastic is. Um, so you don't want to push down very hard where you're, when you're sanding on this. Um, and you really do want to use a block pretty much all the time when you're trying to fill in holes and gaps and that kind of stuff. You can probably see uh, this scratch right here. I don't think that's actually a, a scratch on the surface or anything. I think I scratched the filler. Um, in my sanding. So I'll probably actually have a scratch in the finish right there. I won't really know that until I go, I can't feel it. You know, I can't feel that there's a scratch there. So until I primer this, I won't really know if there's a real scratch there or not. 
Um, you normally don't paint directly on top of something like this. You would want to primer it and then maybe even sand that primer. I usually sand the primer before I paint it. Um, I didn't on this side, I just sprayed over it. Um, but uh, sand the primer with a block uh, as much as you can and uh, then you'll kind of get an idea. Uh, but I wouldn't put paint directly on top of this. For one thing, you'd have paints are always going to be some amount of transparent. Even really dark paints are going to be some amount of transparent. And you're going to pick up the really bright white here versus the dark colors over here. Um, and it, that's going to show through. Sometimes you can use that to your advantage when you want a, a modeled type, uh, you know, blotchy type surface. But um, here we want to we want to make it look new and then we want to make it look old so um, i want to primer this i just want you to see kind of what you're going for when you're trying to fill in all these little gaps is you almost want it to show worse and that's showing that all the pri the filler is stuck down in those holes and we've sanded down to where they're pretty much even the filler surface is even with the plastic surface um, so we'll go in and we'll put a uh, primer on top of that later on and um, we'll see how it does. All right, these pieces, uh, they hold the scope body on. Uh, this one's straight off the printer. This one has been sanded and primered, but I wanted to show a different product here. Um, I'm not gonna use it right now, um, just because it's, it doesn't clean up with water. It cleans up with like a, a paint thinner type thing. So I don't wanna get that out right here and make a big mess potentially. It is basically something like this, some kind of putty that's been thinned down. So it's really, really thick. Um, it's called this Mr. Surfacer 500 from Mr. Hobby. Now you definitely have to order this unless you have a, a model shop nearby, but pretty much. Um, it comes from Japan. I can't read most of the instructions. Like the only thing I can read on here is the one that says Mr. somewhere in there. But, um, and I can read that, but the rest of it, uh, but basically all it does is it is, well, let's open. I don't know if you'll be able to tell much about it by looking at it, but uh, it is a really thick uh, primer and you can brush it on. You could spray it on also. You might even have to thin it down to spray it on. Uh, I think they make different uh, numbers here that are thinner and thicker. Actually, this may be the thickest one. Um, but what I want to do with it is I want to brush it on these because these, the best I can tell, are supposed to be uh, kind of this cast surface, so it's a little bit lumpy. So I actually want it to be a little uneven um, and bumpy when I, when I paint it. Um, I think what I will try is this one's been sanded a good bit. Now you can still see a little bit of layer lines in here. Um, sanded and primered and sanded again. This one, again, is just off the printer and um, I think what I want to try is maybe sanding the top of this one just to get those worst ridges off of there and just putting this on top of it and see you know which one looks more like what I'm looking for these are really easy to print so if we have to make a new one that's fine um, all right let's zoom back out so you're not so close to this stuff um, I think that's all of the updates on stuff that I have worked on painting wise let's go to simplify 3d so Simplify 3D is a, uh, another slicer like Cura or Prusa Slicer or whatever, but it's not free. Uh, it's, I don't know, I think the license is maybe $100, maybe something like that. It was that at one point, I don't know what it is now. Um, but it's not free and I don't even know, I assume they have a demo, but I don't even know that. Uh, I've had it a, a long time, so I don't know what the current, like how you currently go about getting it. But here it is. And um, it, you know, it has the same kind of thing where there's a, a bed that represents your printer um, and you can uh, do some operations like in Cura where you can rotate it and scale and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, you slice a model. So I thought we'd get a model. Let's see, I have I went and looked at Thingiverse for some of the things that look like they're popular right now. Um, and I saw this guy and, you know, it's a Mandalorian guy. So I thought I'd get him. So I went, I downloaded, um, I did one that had a base 
I think this is the one I downloaded. Yeah, it's down here. So that's the one I downloaded. All right. So let's bring him. So over here in uh, Simplify 3D, you would import versus open. Uh, so import, and he ended up in downloads, I guess. There he is. All right. So, and then he pops in. So it looks very similar to how Cura would operate. In fact, I think I have Cura open. So we would do the same thing, open. Uh, let's see, he was in downloads. There he is. Get this out of the way, we're zoomed in really close. Let's see if we can zoom out. So looks the same. All right. So you can kind of get the idea that you start out the same. Now over here, this is back in Sim uh, Simplify 3D. Uh, I have different profiles like you would uh, for Cura. You know, you have a profile for your Ender printer and a profile for your TiVo and whatever, however many printers you have, you have a different profile for them. So um, over here, you, you go in and you edit this pro the processes. You can have a whole stack of processes for different parts of the model or different models on the thing where uh, maybe they have different print speeds well uh yeah you could change the print speed uh you could change the infill the number of walls all kind of different stuff like that so you click on that double click on that to open it open up this window where you could go in and here's your different profiles i have these built in here right now you can upload many others it'll import profiles if you find someone who has already built a profile for the printer you're using um, you can import their profile into yours and actually that's what I did to uh, get the this is Ender 2 um, there's an Ender 3 Pro um, hmm. we'll use Ender 3 Pro sure it's not that we don't have a Pro but uh, we'll use the 3 Pro for now um, and we just want to make sure over here that uh, we have the right nozzle diameter yes we do have a 0.4 Usually for the extrusion multiplier for PLA, you usually want that at 0.9. Um, and for, if you're doing something like ABS, maybe at one. Um, this basically either scales back in our case of doing 0.9, so 90%, or scales up if you do over one for over 100%. The amount of filament that's being extruded uh, per you know movement of the nozzle or whatever. Um, and so for PLA, a good starting point is usually 0.9 with most setups um, that's that would apply in other software too uh, but in, in I'm particularly talking about simplified 3d right now um, all right uh, let's see let's see what speed it's set at um, it's set at 5400 now this is millimeters per minute cura if you're thinking of those numbers are in millimeters per second so we have to do some math 5400 divided by 60 that's 90, that's a lot. That's 90 millimeters per second. I don't know that our little Ender 3 is gonna print at 90 millimeters per second. That, let's, let's say that we go with 50 millimeters per second. 50 times 60 would be 3,000 millimeters per minute. Um, outline under speed, so um, Cura does this also. Basically, when you're doing an outline, it will go in and uh, go slower at some percentage of your normal printing speed and it's usually 50% uh, Solid infill under speed. So I think Cura actually does um, Infill speed print speed. I don't know if it does it as a percentage or not. It might um, Support structure. So it's basically not it's slowing down a little bit from your default printing speed, but um, Almost a hundred percent. It's 80% um, and then these are your travel speeds uh, when it's not printing but moving to a new location to print. So maybe those, I don't know, 6,000, let's see, six, well, that would be 100 millimeters per second. Um, that's probably okay. So the, what can happen if these are too high, the traveling speeds? Um, if you set those too high, first of all, you don't gain that much because your printer isn't traveling uh, not printing very often so you don't gain a whole lot by setting these really high um, but if you set them too high then it can try to particularly in the y direction if it's having to move the bed on like an ender 3 printer it can try to move that massive bed and all the stuff that's on it 
uh, too fast and it can skip some steps. The stepper motor can think it moved but didn't actually move as far as it did and you'll hit, get layer shifting. So uh, if you have a lot of layer shifting, you might your traveling speeds might be too high. Um, are there accelerations? I don't know how to get to acceleration in Simplify 3D. I'm, I'm sure you can, I just don't see it right now. Um, I'd have to dig that up. But basically it's how fast do you switch from one speed to another. Um, all right, so point two, uh, this is a little tiny guy. So it looks like he came in, you know, if we zoom out, oh, I have to close that. We zoom out, he looks pretty small, not terribly big. So um, let's say that the layer height, oh, oh, because I didn't switch, I didn't, I canceled it. <laughs> so there we go. Let's go to point one two, layer height. All right. Now he's over here because we're in we're in the other printer now. We can center him and put him in the middle. It had switched back to the Ender two. The Ender two um, is kind of a, just a generation before this one. It's a different style printer though. It has a uh, smaller bed and a cantilevered arm instead of where the Ender three has the H frame design. You know, it's got a, a gantry the uh, Ender 2 has a little cantilevered arm and it's a little bit smaller printer. Uh, I have one, but I don't have it here to show you. Um, but anyway, here's this guy. Let's prepare to print. So that's basically slice. All right, so he does not look right. So this is the slicing preview and he's got holes all in his head and in his arms and everywhere. Um, if we Scroll down here, you can kind of see just parts of him are just missing. So it turns out how this model was made was through, uh, it's hollow. It's only shells, so it's all hollow. So in order to fix that, uh, we've got we to gotta do a, something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring him into a mesh mixer and see if we can fix him over there. There's There are some online... Um, if your model just has holes in it and things like that, there are some online tools that you can upload the model, the STL file, and it'll auto repair and plug up holes. Um, this one's not holes though. It looks like holes, but, um, it's actually that the whole thing is hollow. It says it's generating mesh. Oh, there we go. All right. So first of all, we got all, we have him in mesh mixer and we got all these dots. So maybe he does have some holes. So let's go to analysis inspector. And uh, yeah, it's got all kinds of issues here. So let's just repair all of that automatically. That doesn't fix all of his problems, but it fixes some problems. In fact, you can kind of see where it patched up some mesh things that it, it didn't know what there were holes or whatever. I didn't look close enough. All right, but he's still hollow. And uh, I don't know if that would be easy to figure out other than looking at when he sliced and seeing where, um, well, let's see, is he still over there? You can kind of tell in the legs is where I noticed. Yeah, right here. See, there's there should be some infill in here unless you had it set to zero infill. And it's just hollow there. There's, you know, every now and then you get a little bit of a, uh, piece that might be infill and there's some infill over here but there's parts of him that are just hollow all right so let's go in and use the edit tool and there is a make solid button all right so it's going to go through and do some preliminary calculations and then it'll let us set some sliders Remember that with large, this was a um, 30 megabyte file, so that's kind of large, and that uh, mesh mixer sometimes will crash with larger files. So uh, we he's solid now. Now this is its first attempt. Uh, this was the fast version, and you can I don't know if you noticed it, but he certainly looks more uh, lumpy now versus actually having details. Probably he would be fine because he's not going to be very big, but um, I think we can do better than this. So we'll go to accurate 
And let's just do that one change and update him and see what he looks like with accurate. Not a lot better. Um, so that means we need to come in here into these. So all the accuracy and mesh density and slide them over. Let's slide them over a little bit. So this is gonna uh, mean it will take longer to figure out, but uh, it's gonna be uh, using smaller triangles to, to remap him. So we'll update. And you could have just changed one of the sliders. We changed both of them to create a higher density mesh and, all right, that's better. It's better and it didn't take terribly long. There's still some details that are getting lost, like right in there. Looks like there probably were better details. Um, let's let's see if we can go a little bit higher on the accuracy and a little bit higher on the uh, mesh density here. So you can kind of see the cell size is getting smaller and smaller. That is basically the size of the individual uh, triangles that are being used to create the mesh. So the more I slide these sliders over, the longer it's going to take. What's in advanced? I forget what's it. Oh, yeah, we can leave those alone. All right, let's see how long this takes. And at some point, you do have to remember that we plan to print him at a really small height, you know, an inch and a half tall or whatever. So we're, we're, we're going to get to the point of it doesn't make any difference. Now that looks, I don't know, I think that looks pretty good. You can... You know, all of this stuff down here resolved pretty well. The holster's okay. Um, you can kind of see some of the damage on his guard there. It's, it's kind of washed out up here. But again, he's going to only be, I don't know, like that, that big maybe. And I think at that point, we're probably pretty good. So we will accept that. So if you don't accept it, it just defaults back to where it was. So we're going to accept that. And then we will export him. And uh, let's put him on the desktop. Man, oops, all right. Not sure why I'm typing in all caps. All right, so now hopefully he's been fixed. So let's go back to Simplify 3D. Um, exit preview mode, remove this guy and import the new guy. Uh, put him on the desktop there, yes. All right. So it doesn't look terribly different, which is good. We didn't, I keep making the wrong movements. Simplify 3D uses a different set of mouse buttons for rotate, zoom, and pan uh, than Cura. So I don't always remember which ones are the correct uh, sequence of buttons to push to make him do the different things. So like this is rotate in Cura, but it's pan in Simplify 3D. All right, let's make sure we're good over here. Um, we're going to do 0.12 millimeter layer height. That was one of the magic numbers for the Ender 3. Um, and it's about as small as I'm going to be able to print thin layers uh, with this printer. Um, let's do our trick of making it all solid layers. So let's just say a thousand top layers. Um, that way it'll print the whole thing as a solid top layer. Um, he's going to need support. It definitely looks like that. Hold on. Let's click OK. There's no way that it, this this part over here is going to print just floating in air like that. So it's definitely going to need support there. Um, and then probably he's going to need support under here. Uh, where else might he need So The holster might need a little bit of support. This arm is going to, so he's going to have a good bit of support to deal with. Um, so let's turn on support. Generate support material. Um, we'll leave those okay. All right. Uh, oh, well, let's check our speeds. Did we know it's still at that super fast speed? Let's go down to the 3,000 millimeters per minute. Um, those are okay. Uh, let's see. Other scripts, G code. We don't need the cooling. Uh, that's fine temperature 200 is fine for this material uh, we are generating support infill doesn't actually matter because we're printing them all as top layers so there won't be any infill 
Um, we can use a skirt. Uh, let's do one layer of skirt, offset four millimeters and two. So that's the, the two traces outside of it, kind of to purge the nozzle and make sure we've got everything set up right. Uh, that looks okay. All right, so let's prepare him to print now and see if he's still... All right, that looks way better. I don't see any missing pieces. So I think our make solid over in... Uh, mesh mixer solved him but there's no support on his hand which there's no way it's going to print floating in air like that so i'm not quite sure why it didn't why it thinks it can do that because um, it clearly can't so this would not work um and there's just no way it's going to print there let's see if we can figure out why it's doing that. Uh, nope. Maybe um, it's too small of an area and I've got it set to only um, support larger parts. Let's drop this down to two and re-slice him and see if... All right, so that did it. So it's just that it's too small of a point to uh, actually build the support with it me having a minimum size of four millimeters. Um, now it also supported up here, which I don't know that we actually need. I think that would have been fine. It might have drooped a tiny bit, but it'd have been fine. Um, it looks like we might have a little bit less support over here now uh, than what we had before. Um, but at least we have support everywhere and we have support back here. So, uh, that looks better. So it says it would take an hour and a half to print him. Let's look at the same thing in Cura and see what happens over there. Um, all right, so let's get our fixed model. Uh, he was on the desktop, fixed, because it would have the same problem with the hollow model. <clears throat> oh, well now, here it already says that it's not manifold, meaning it has holes in it, even on the fixed one. Um, I don't know exactly. It usually is okay and can figure it out. Uh, so let's go ahead. Let's see. We're at 0.12. We've already got our thousand top layers. Um, two walls. Oh, yeah, we can look at those walls. Acura uh, and Simplify 3D do walls a little bit differently. Um, temperature is fine. Print speed's at 40. Support will definitely need to be on everywhere. I'm not sure why we're at 59 for our angle. Maybe I did a test. Let's put it back to 45 because that's what was in Simplify 3D. All right, let's slice that. See what we get. A uh, little bit longer. Let's preview and see what it has. I don't know why that's in the way. There we go. We've got issues with drawing it somehow. Um, it did pick up that it needs to support, I actually like these supports better. Normally Simplify 3D does a good job of supports, but I, I think these supports would actually work a lot better than the ones that, uh, Simplify 3D was proposing. Um, but he looks good. He looks pretty much solid. Uh, though that emptiness is the, uh, supports. Now those are going to be a little bit harder to remove, but, uh, Looks like it's not attached to anything until it's actually supporting the hand and the gun and that kind of thing. All right, so let's look at a section here. All right, so we told it to have, um, should have been two walls. Yes, two walls. And it kind of looks like there's three walls, right? There's one, two, and then it looks like the third one. So Cura draws an outline for the infield its own outline, which makes it look like it. you actually have, if you say two walls, it makes it look like there's three walls. Typically, and I didn't actually check here, but typically what's gonna happen, <laughs> I can't remember the ways to move this thing, uh, in Simplify 3D, yeah, it uses one of the walls as the wall for the infill, so you really only have two walls. Uh, so, and th this support, in here is just kind of weird we probably would need to tweak some support settings in simplify 3d because 
It's got random ones kind of where you wouldn't want them. Um, but see, it, it does two walls, but one of the walls is the wall for the infill. So they do slice a little bit differently. Um, Cura, or this is Simplify 3D, and Cura with what appears to be an extra wall, but it's the wall of the infill. Um, although I do like the supports better over here, even though there's a lot of them. Um, I think that one would be pretty easy to remove. That would certainly be easy to remove. These would be okay. It's the ones that come up inside here, and it looks like they kind of wrapped around this leg down here, his right leg. It looks like it kind of has support around it. Um, that might be a little bit difficult to peel off of there, but as long as you have tuned the gap between the top of the support and the part it's being supported in Cura, you, it does a decent job of pulling those off of there um, when you go to break them away. All right, um, let's go back to Simplify 3D, see if there's any other things that I might show you in here. Um, at, this, at this point, you would just save it to your SD card and go print it. Um, but let's, well, I don't, I don't want to actually save it. Let's exit that. Um, let's see if there's any other interesting things in here that um, might need pointing out. Um, I use Simplify 3D. Because in general, it does a, a good job of printing, but right now it's certainly not doing a great job of supporting. Let's dump this up to three millimeters and see. Um, if we get a better looking set of supports. Well, see now it, it again didn't support the, didn't even support the gun this time. Now I don't usually slice on similar, uh, Simplify 3D for the Ender, though I usually use it for a different printer, so it may be that I've never gone in and tuned these to work well with the Ender. At least now it has support, but it's got this really, really, you know, raggedy kind of support setup. Don't really like that. Uh, let's see, let's just try a little bit more. Let's increase our in percentage support base layers. Oh, combine every one layer. Um, well, that would be okay. The only options here are only touching the build platform, which we don't want because we certainly have parts that are over the base of the model. Um, that would need to be supported. So we want normal. Um, we'll drop this even lower. That angle is pretty standard. That is pretty close, actually. This is just how far away from the uh, model itself will the support be. How close will it be? Um, so you don't want it too close because it might fuse to it, but you don't want it, you know, a millimeter away either. Um... Well, let's just do it one more time and see what we get. Yeah, it looks better. It still has some of these random ones up here around his neck that uh, probably wouldn't do anything other than get in the way. But uh, kind of how Simplify 3D works. Uh, it works a little bit different when you go to like, you have to double click on it and here are all your transform, rotate, all that kind of stuff over here. Um, whereas you get a little uh, gizmo type thing in Cura that you can drag around here. You actually go in and, uh, you know, you type in, you want to rotate him or whatever. And then the center and arrange button gets him back on the build surface. There are some features where you can go in and um, lay a certain surface on the ground. Now in this case it figured out that this base is the obvious one that should be on the ground. Um, I think that's this. No, that's show normals. Where is it at? Oh, customize support structures. Let's click on that. Normal. We can, all right, so let's go in here. So there's the ones it wants to automatically add. We can remove those because they're not going to do anything but get in the way and we can add some new ones. 
Maybe we want another one there. Maybe we don't want that one in there. Let's remove it. So this is the part I do like where you can go in and, you know, easily just add or subtract supports. I don't, like I said, I don't think I need this one. So we can just click on, all I'm doing is clicking on them to, to remove them. Um, add some more, you know, if you think you, let's see where it might, oh, well out here for sure. I don't know if I can, I think I'm use, controlling the base of it. So it's a little bit tricky. I wish I could click on the model, but if I do, it just, it just does that. It doesn't bring it all the way to the base. So I don't, I don't want that one on there. Um, so you kind of have to line them up. Like that. Um, what else? That looks like it would probably work now. Maybe, maybe this lowest part of his finger. And I don't know that we need that one. Probably get rid of that one. And I don't know that we need any of those or that one. Th I mean, there might be a little bit of drooping right there, but I think it would print fine. And this very tip might um, might not print or it might droop, but I think at the scale that this guy would be printed at, we could just fix that by sanding or whatever or cutting it off and it would be fine. So now I think we have uh, a better shot at this thing so let's prepare to print now and see what we get now look we've got support all where we wanted it none where we didn't think it was necessary uh, and we remove the stuff over here and we could probably move i didn't notice it but this doesn't look particularly necessary over here but you have to go into the customize button uh, to actually do it so we have to exit the preview mode customize them and remove and then done and we can prepare to print again and again there might be a little droop right there but I think it'd print fine um, what else is I don't remember oh yeah if you want to actually uh, connect your USB cable to the printer um, then you can uh, monitor it as it's printing kind of like we did with the um, uh, Repetier host, I think is what we used. All right, um, that gets us a, a little intro to Simplify 3D, how it's different, some of the things. I think the, the primary, at least what I think, the primary advantage of it is that you can, on the fly, go in and change these supports the way that you want them. Um, whereas you can kind of do that in Cura. You have to use those support blockers and things like that. Um, but I think that's one of the, the big advantages of it. Um, it does slice a little bit differently. I do tend to get slightly better prints from it than I do um, Cura uh, most of the time. I don't, I mean, on average, they're better. Um, and you have control over many, many features over here. And the same model can have multiple process. I could add another process over here and apply it to a, a particular part. Or whatever um, so there are some advantages are they worth the extra money not until you actually are doing a lot of printing uh, let's, let's see if we can find how much it actually costs now because I don't I don't actually know the price of it let's see and if they have a demo oh they're gonna update I guess I could update uh, yeah it's 150 so it's a little bit more than it used to be um, let's see if there is a demo. I don't know that there is. I don't see any. I don't see any. Uh, when I said this has a mesh repair, I've never done that. Um, so maybe it could have. The mesh, the original problem we had when it wasn't printing, wasn't a problem necessarily with the mesh. It was a problem with the person who created the model made part of it hollow. And it was just at that scale, you know, an inch and a half tall or whatever, it was too small to actually print with the nozzle that uh, I have. I have ordered, oh, let me show you these. I have ordered 
some hardened steel nozzles because I got another one of these boxes and inside it was a bunch of stickers some PETG a cool color red PETG that's not what it's interested this a steel filled metal composite PLA um, but it says that it's it certainly said it would be abrasive anything that are have a feel in them are going to be abrasive and this one's filled with steel so it's basically you know you're you're running sandpaper through the nozzle so a brass nozzle is is probably couldn't even print this roll without being worn out um, and it says you should use a 0.6 so I've ordered some um, 0 0.4 0 0.6 and 0 0.8 uh, millimeter hardened steel nozzles I just picked them up off of Amazon uh, they were like they're a little more six dollars each where a brass nozzle might be a dollar or so um, and there are certainly there are much more expensive nozzles um, but I thought I'd try this out I wish you could feel it like it's significantly heavier than just this regular PO PETG um, and I think it's the same looks like it's probably the same amount as far as the length goes um, but it's significantly heavier so you can it definitely has uh, some metal a, a high concentration of metal in it um, but it would print 210 to 230 or ender can do that um, bed temperature could be anywhere from the room to 60 the ender can do that um, it doesn't list the speed typically with something like this you have to go a little slow um, it needs cooling we have cooling that just means that the it needs to cool uh, the layer fan needs to cool and it is a PLA so that makes sense um, we just didn't, I don't want to run it through a regular uh, nozzle because it would just eat it up really quickly. Um, so I want to try this out. Um, I think those nozzles should come in maybe before Friday. Maybe we can try this out then. I'm sure it will be difficult to print. It's probably very brittle. Uh, typically these with high metal, uh, like copper and different uh, metal fills in them are pretty brittle. Um, but I wanted to try that out. Let's just see what. Oh, there was also a TPU, a really flexible, bright blue TPU. We could print that possibly. Um, this is really flexible though, so I don't know how well it would print with the Bowden tube. We did switch our tube over to a Capricorn tube. This guy, Capricorn tube. So it is more stiff and, and tighter tolerances, so that might give us a better chance of printing some of this really flexible stuff. I'll give it a shot and see. Um, and then just a PLA gold. I don't think there's anything. Well, it says it's a special blend for improved toughness and shelf life. Now, I've never, without um, like a really long amount of time, I don't typically have problems with PLA and shelf life. So remember, um, all these filaments will absorb moisture from the air over time. Um, there are some filaments like the TPU and the uh, ABS and some of those uh, carbon fiber, all those kind of materials will suck moisture out of the air really quickly, assuming it's more humid than they already have moisture content, which in where I'm at is definitely more humid. Um, but PLA, I've never had a lot of trouble with that, but maybe this has some improvements. Um, it is a nice color though, it's kind of shiny. Um, other than that, uh, it does say improved toughness, so we'll see. Um, all right, so I wanted to print some of this. I just need to get a nozzle that's going to not self-destruct when I try to print that stuff with it. Um, and it says that it can be um, sanded, brushed, polished, so we'll see. I don't know if there's a part on our blaster that would make sense to print with that, but maybe, maybe there's something. Oh, you know. Maybe, maybe one of these would be a good thing to try and print uh, in that steel and see what that would look like. Um, we'll, we'll try that out once I get the nozzle in. All right, um, I think that's good for today. Um, I, the next thing I want to do is go back to here, uh, model this up. I don't think I'll model that up to as part of this video or not. Um, it shouldn't take us very long at all. I'll probably just do it in Tinkercad because it's just a cone with, I'm gonna do a flat head across the top. Actually, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll do that off screen. Um, and then we'll hopefully have some of these to work on. The more of the body working out, uh, this guy's gotta get worked on, uh, primered and painted up. And I'll decide what I'm gonna do with the, 
the darker versus the lighter handle if I leave them or what I'll do. I don't know yet. Um, all right. That's enough for today. I'll see you all later.